welcome emails have an average open rate of 82% and 49% of consumers said they would like to receive promotional emails from their favourite brands. So that's a big lot of people who actually like receiving emails, who like hearing from their favourite brands and you'll be a favourite brand for them. Nobody wants to know about me. Well, to the people who sign up for your newsletter, you're a rock star. Basically, I think because we hang out with a lot of other authors, we forget how, how amazing being an author is to a lot of other people. They just, you're, you're incredible and you do something that they just can't fathom doing themselves. So you're interesting and they're fascinated to know about you. You're a rock star. Wear the badge with pride. People only sign up to a newsletter to get a freebie. Well, most of the time that's true. But by signing up, they give you the opportunity to sell to them, to wow them, to, to turn them to being your audience. Um, you just have to know how to, how to harness that and embrace it. Better off spending my time writing. Well, if you don't have a novel that's going to be published on a specific date, yes, you should get that novel written, get the publishing sorted and go from there. So if you don't have a, a novel that's ready to be published or that has, that you expect to be published soon, eventually you shouldn't be doing a newsletter. There are a lot of people who say start your newsletter straight away. Well there's no point because you're going to turn your readers off if you don't give them what they signed up expecting to get. All right so finish your novel, get the publishing sorted and, and a set date for that. Now once you've done that a commercial author is going to spend about half of their time on marketing which is a pig there's not much you can do about it. Marketing is two different things, promotions and advertising. Your newsletter falls under the promotion side of it. And the last one is better off spending my time on social media. Well, I have the theory that marketing, well, I don't have the theory that marketing, marketing is all the different types of media that you can do. Um, emails, social media, your website, TV, radio, newspapers, whatever you can get. And I have, this is my theory, that all of the different Bennett sisters um, represent different bits of marketing. So social media is like Lydia, Lydia Bennett, she knows all the news, she has a massive circle of friends and her opinions change with the latest craze and her interactions are usually kind of superficial and she'll get bored if you don't entertain her. Your website is like Mary Bennett. There's a lot of information in there, but you're not going to hear it until you ask her. She's happy enough to, to give you the information if you ask her, but you've got to go to her. Um, your newsletter is like Elizabeth Bennett. She likes meeting new people, doesn't really tolerate time wasters. She likes conversations that are more than 140 characters at a time and is prepared to speak in depth about subjects that interest her. Um, glossy mags are like Jane Bennett. She's um, kind of flashy and pretty and, you know, fussy, I don't know, glossy. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to hear your opinions on what Kitty Bennett represents because the kind of the whole analogy kind of falls over until I find out what Kitty Bennett actually is. So yeah, I guess she's she's like the fangirl, she's the the commenter. So if you do come up with something for Kitty Bennett, let me know. Um, so your marketing activities should include being active on social media and having a newsletter, getting your website current, all of that stuff. But when you're just starting out, you have to decide where you're going to start, which one of those you're going to do first. And the reason that you start with a newsletter is because you own 
those email addresses. All right, let me explain that. On social media, your followers aren't owned. Um, if they decide to change the algorithms on Facebook tomorrow and all of your followers are taken off you, there's nothing you can do about that except to try and start building it again. And don't think that can't happen because it actually has happened. Your website visitors are not captive. Now, what I mean by that is you're not marketing directly to them. They have to come to you before they're going to get any information from you. So they can come and go. Um, they probably miss out on a lot of the stuff that you put up on your website. Newsletter subscribers are what we call owned captives. You own their email address. They've given you permission to use that. And they're captive in that your email gets put directly in front of them. They're going to see it because people check their emails. And that's um, how your newsletter subscribers are, where you should start because of that owned captive, um, because they are those owned captives. All right, so what have we learned so far? Oh, so much. Your newsletter has three parts to its life cycle. In the first part, you're building your name, gaining recognition and getting your ARC team together. People like to receive newsletters. They actually like it. People want to hear about you because, let's face it, you're awesome. And newsletters should be just one part of your overall marketing strategy, but they should be the place where you start. So let's have a look at who your audience actually is. All right, so your potential audience is those people who would consider reading your novel or novels. And this is never everyone. In fact, most of the time, it's a small portion of the reading public who themselves are but a small portion of the public as a whole. So to make this whole author caper pay off for you eventually, you need to target your marketing as tightly as you can. So the better you are at targeting, the better response <clears throat> excuse me, you get to marketing efforts and the more potential sales you make. This is because you're concentrating on the people who are interested in what you have to offer. Now, the problem with that is that it's much easier to work out who your target market is if you've already got a bit of a list going. Because if you've got a list going, you can survey them and you can A-B test, which means that you change one thing on your email send it out to a small portion of your list and decide which one of those things works better and then send the best, best one out to your whole list. Um, at the moment, since you don't have a list that you can survey, the only thing that you can really target are genre and themes. Genre, subgenre and themes and also tropes. So, Genre is obviously a wide category, romance, mystery, adventure, science fiction. Your subgenres are the categories inside a genre. So examples of subgenre in romance are things like historical, romantic suspense, contemporary, paranormal, wholesome, inspirational, Western, rural, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, themes are specific story situations that could exist across all genres. For example, if your theme is women warriors, you could be writing a romance, but you could also be writing um, space opera or military post-apocalyptic. So it's not specific to romance, whereas tropes are the common story situations that are specific to a genre. And for romance, our tropes are things like friends to lovers, fake engagement, secret baby, second chance at love, forced proximity, that kind of thing. So you can see how those are going to be specific to romance. Um, tropes exist for all genres and subgenres. And it's likely that for whatever you've written, you'll have some subgenres or a subgenre and then some themes and tropes. Or potentially you could have more than one subgenre because subverting tropes is something that writers have been having fun with. And we can tell because of things like 
Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. All right. So it doesn't really matter what you call them, subgenres and tropes and themes. They're all just shorthand ways of identifying who your book will appeal to. Um, that's the entire purpose of them, which is to categorise your books so that those readers who are looking for what you're writing can find it. This table, although not quite so pretty, is on page 12 of the manual and our first exercise for the course is going to be for you to identify your genres. Well, that should be not too difficult. They're probably all going to be romance. Um, your subgenres, themes and tropes. Now, if you don't have um, any books out, you can use the stories you've written. And if you haven't written any stories, you can use the ones that are floating around in your head. We're basically looking for the encapsuling of what you write. So when I did this little exercise myself, um, I discovered, well, I wrote, I write both in historical romance and fantasy. So I did my historical romance side. Um, and I discovered that strangely enough, my audience is historical romance who like a bit of adventure and I pretty much always have a strong female lead. Some of my books don't hit a specific romance trope, which kind of explains why they don't sell particularly well in the romance genre, but that's kind of another conversation. And I also do touch quite a bit on mental illness. Um, just to explain for what's up on the screen there, the fish out of water trope is where your protagonist is put into a situation where they're not comfortable they they have to work out how to make themselves comfortable and your ugly duckling trope is the one where the plain friend goes from ugly, ugly duckling to beautiful swan and they use it a lot in teen romance but of course i didn't use it in teen romance your names and titles of the subgenres change regularly i mean we didn't have things like reverse harem at all until a few years ago or bully romance or academy romance and themes and tropes go in and out of style. So one of the best places to discover what the various genres and subgenres sub are is to visit amazon.com. It's not the only place to find them, but it's good because they list the genres and subgenres so they're easy to find. So you're gonna pop over to Amazon. Um, just give me a second because I have to remember how to do it. I have to come out of one Zoom screen share and hop across to another one. So you'll see my adorable face for uh, a little while. I promise you it won't be for too much of a while. So this is the one I want. So sharing that one. Okay. So can you please um, just confirm with me that you can see the screen there. I just have to find my chat window again. No, my chat window is gone. So um, I'm just going to assume that you can. <laughs> oh no, here it is. There we go. Okay.